Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's podcast conversation. I'm really excited to have with us today Supes Ranjan, who's the CEO and founder at Sardine. And we're going to talk about that fantastic company and everything it does to enable the crypto space. And of course, Supes has a really interesting background as an entrepreneur, as a technologist, and we will open up all of those topics. So with that, Supes, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Lex. My pleasure. Let's start with the basics. When you started your career and you started thinking about your interests and kind of building things, what things stood out? What were the passions that you followed? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great question because, yeah, I have been in the business of fighting bad actors for pretty much entire my entire career, which is 20 plus years now. And most recently, when I was at Coinbase heading risk for them, and then later when I went to Revolut heading financial crime and later crypto for them, one of the patterns of fraud that was increasingly becoming popular is social engineering fraud. Social engineering essentially takes many forms, but one of the forms that it was taking in 2017 was you would get a call from someone who is pretending to be tech support for you know, uh, crypto exchange, or maybe it could be for tech support for things like Microsoft. And then they convince you, essentially, to create an account at your most popular crypto exchange or at an online brokerage or at a fintech, and essentially then convince you to send money somewhere, or at some point of time, they may actually take over your screen and they may you know blank out the, the screen completely so you're not even aware of what's happening, and then they run off with the money. I could get into more details of how this fraud is perpetrated and how we catch it, etc. But the important point here is that in 2017, it was happening in crypto. And now, lo and behold, it's actually social engineering tech support scams or other forms of it, like big butchering is another one, just simple romance scams, etc. They have also now taken hold in Zelle and other push payment methods in the UK, where, for example, in the UK, push payment fraud is now like the fraud losses associated with it exceed card losses. Zelle scams have become so prevalent that Congress has taken has started taking a look into it as well. So I'll, I'll take a quick pause over here and, and happy to take the conversation further. I want to talk about financial crime and bad actors and maybe some even existential things about that. And the thing that kind of strikes me about it is that number one is there's an issue of scale. So we're not talking about some incremental bad thing that, you know, is an attack on on a company one time, but rather something that is happening in real time at the level of our financial systems, you know, perpetually and arguably can't be brought down to zero. So you need to have a sense of scale and building for scale. And in your early career, you did a lot of technology work you know, for cloud and for the web and kind of was exposed to scale of that type. Can you talk a little bit about the first few times that you became interested or that you saw the problem of, let's just call it attacks, whatever they would be like, you know, whether it's malware or spam or botnets or whatever it is. And what drew you to those topics? I was attracted to solving for problems using data, right? Some of the hardest financial crime or fraud problems or security problems, the best way of solving for them is essentially by mining data. And so therefore, I I did my PhD thesis in network security, and this is 2005. And then I was looking for my first job out of grad school, and I came across a tech startup, which was actually in the business of fighting cyber cyber security essentially bot attacks, malware attacks, etc. by essentially you know, looking at network traffic data. And we are talking not, you know, we're talking like petabytes of traffic per day type data. Like the scale was just humongous because we would be looking at data flowing through the pipes of the largest carriers in the world and solving for, you know, 
security problems in at such scale is, is incredibly difficult and therefore incredibly exciting as well. So that's what attracted me to this field. I essentially became a data scientist before the term data scientist was coined. And how has the space got evolved over the time that you've been in it? Another more basic question would just be like, what is a bad actor? Who or what is interested in perpetrating scams or in you know, social engineering? Like, Who's the adversary? Who's the Voldemort here? So the adversary here are essentially, I would say, two, two forms, right? So one is what we call in the industry third-party fraud. Second is social engineering fraud. And then the third is first party fraud. So actually, I misspoke. It's three, not two types. So the first type, which is third party fraud, is basically, you know, someone buys stolen cards or stolen bank accounts on the dark web. And then they also buy stolen driver licenses or stolen identities on the dark web. And then they go in into a crypto exchange or a stock brokerage or a new bank, and then they create these thousands or tens of thousands or millions of accounts using these stolen identities. And then they link these stolen cards to to purchase crypto or to load money into a, into a digital wallet. Then they withdraw the crypto or in the case of new bank wallet, they go to the nearest ATM and then they withdraw cash. Right. So therefore, the new forms of money movement via via fintech and crypto becomes a way for them to layer their activity as in they are able to use these new forms of payment methods as a stepping stone to perpetrating their fraud. The second type would be social engineering, which I already alluded to earlier, right? In which case the, the perpetrators or the bad actors are typically originating from Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, India, etc. Oftentimes a lot of these bad actors are essentially folks who work in call centers for their day job. And then in the nighttime is when they are perpetrating these illicit activities to make, make a quick buck. So they, they would basically have all the apparatus to, to make calls because they work in a call center. And then they are essentially dialing up you know, thousands of numbers a day, trying to social engineer someone into sending them money. Right? And then the third category is first party fraud. So now the first party fraud is is basically in this this is the most difficult one. This is essentially someone who knows the system of money movement so well that they themselves would sign up for an account using their own identity, connecting their own bank account, connecting their own card, purchasing crypto, for example, and then later they would claim when the trade goes south against them, they claim that they never did it. How sophisticated are these counterparties? Very sophisticated. So to the extent that, for example, for the third party fraud, as well as the social engineering scams, right, you have you have these folks operating almost like a cartel, where you know, there are folks who are working on the field, and then they are sending messages up the chain of command. In the case of social engineering fraud, you know, there's tons of YouTube videos as well nowadays that you can find, for example, YouTube famous YouTubers like Mark Rober, etc. They have made it a passion of theirs to actually go and scan the scammers, right? You can actually watch these videos. They're hilarious. You know, like they, they are often successful in, in infiltrating the call center of uh, these tech support scammers. And then they have these video recordings where they have seen through the webcam how the whole operation is, is, is perpetrated. So yeah, it's, it's not something to be taken lightly of. The scale is so huge that oftentimes I wake up thinking in every day that, you know, if we don't solve for all these attack patterns now, then this whole new financial economy that we are building, which is like new banks or crypto exchanges, exchanges, et cetera, that'll come to nothing. We'll all probably just go back to the stone ages of, you know, brick and mortar banks once again. If we can't really solve for, you know, preventing fraud when you move money digitally. Right. Although I guess I would be interested in how susceptible our traditional systems are to the same issues. Yeah, no, so I just want to clarify. So my my point here being that today, like the one, first and foremost, the traditional institutions like big banks, etc., are equally susceptible. But what I meant was, if you want to keep your money safe, then maybe you should do what my wife does, which is where she doesn't have an online account. <laughs> she just walks in into the bank physically and only provides instructions in, in person, verbally, to the bank teller, right? So that's what I meant. So that's that, that would be the stone ages if all of us had to do that. So in other words, right, like money, once it started moving digitally, 
has made it easier for fraud to happen. And, and we need to solve for that challenge. Gotcha. Absolutely. This would be a convenient time to have statistics on the number of armed robberies of banks, you know, in the 19th and 20th centuries and see if those have gone down as digital fraud has gone up. I am very fascinated by the idea of just how sophisticated the technology is on the other side in terms of spoofing, in in terms of botnets, and in terms of figuring out exactly what it is that will get people to make bad decisions and and click on the wrong link or, you know, share their addresses. If we switch to your time at Coinbase and Revolut, where you're looking at very large interactions with crypto assets for, you know, millions and millions of people, can you talk about the types of things that you were exposed to there and what kinds of approaches you were able to try to combat these problems? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that is really fascinating about crypto is if you solve for fraud at a crypto exchange, then you have solved for it pretty much everywhere else. Because crypto is very liquid, instantly transferable and fungible. And you can't actually, you know, once it's out, you can't recover it back, right? So therefore, it, it when I was at Coinbase, Coinbase and all the other crypto exchanges, we attracted some of the most sophisticated fraudsters ever. Right. Besides the social engineering scam that I mentioned earlier, it started in crypto and now you see it in with Zell. SIM swap attacks, also known as phone porting attacks, the attackers they started going after crypto first, right? One of my memories of, of like 2016, 2017 is essentially you know, the realization that in security, the weakest link is is what matters the most. And turns out that in order to protect your money or protect your crypto assets at a crypto exchange, you have to actually also protect your email and your phone number. Because if they get taken over, then you're toast because then your crypto exchanges get taken over, your bank accounts get taken over, etc. For for those who are not familiar with phone porting or SIM swap attacks, let me just describe that really quickly here. So it is essentially somebody takes over your phone number by calling up your telco provider and claiming that they lost their phone and they pretend to be you. And then they ask the call center operator at the telco, they actually socially engineer the call center operator at the telco into porting your phone number from you know, your device to a device or a new SIM that they control. And now once they have control of your phone number, then they can proceed to resetting every single account of yours. They can proceed to reset your email provider because a lot of folks, they rely on phone number as a backup method to reset your email passwords. Once they have your email and phone reset and in their possession, then they can go on to actually resetting passwords at all your crypto exchanges and banks, et cetera, et cetera. That was one of the you know sort of uh, bellwether attacks that we we saw at Coinbase. We we took me a, a long time to figure out how to solve for it, and and once we solved for it, we saw that you know it started hitting pretty much all the other fintechs and even the brick and mortar banks out there. And in your transition to Revolut, was it very similar types of problems that you encountered, or did they change in any way? Similar types of problems, but you know, some very interesting and different types of vectors as well. For me, the, the most interesting vector uh, that we saw at Revolut was the following in typology, which was essentially all, all of a sudden, a bunch of Revolut users would start getting these, these text messages, which would appear to come from Revolut, but they were not. They were coming from you know, scammers who figured out once again that you could actually make text messages appear to come from any number by using some form of text spoofing or call spoofing. And then they were convincing our customers to actually click on some links. And you would go and click on that link. And the link itself would not really be hosted by revenue.com. They would be hosted by what we call uh, puny code domains, right? So these are domain names where they have essentially changed some of the, the characters, which look like E with an umlaut, etc., uh, which look very similar to the to the naked eye, except now you are landing in a landing page, which again, they had made it look and appear completely like the original website. And now you are essentially interacting with a fake site, providing your credentials, and then the attacker is going back and replaying those credentials at the real site. So again, the bottom line here was that in order for us to truly protect digital money, a lot of changes need to happen. 
first and foremost, we need to stop relying on, you know, using easily breakable passwords. All of us have to use password managers. Secondly, we have to stop relying on uh, phone number as a valid second factor method. Doesn't just doesn't work. And thirdly, going back to my original point, that if you want to protect your money in a digital account, you have to treat your email security and phone security as seriously as your bank security, right? And then fourthly, you can't really trust anymore any text message that you get from any number because you know because of all these call spoofing type patterns that are present. Right. And that's why, you know, non fishable second factor methods like YubiKeys or, you know, Google or Apple's prompts, et cetera, are, you know, what more and more of the financial institutions should start moving towards. I'm feeling so unsafe about all of my devices right now. But hopefully we've got an answer, which is that after watching you know, these issues in a very digitally native financial environment. And of course, all financial firms and brokerages and payment firms have issues of a similar type. But when you touch crypto assets, there is an additional layer of people maybe being impatient or being less experienced or less skeptical or simply more risk-seeking. And so you do have probably on average a higher success rate of people falling for stuff. How did you go towards building your own company to address these problems? And what was the starting point, right? Because this is very broad. And for a scaled company, there's lots of different types of places where you might want to handle fraud. So how did you move towards starting your own company? And then how did you pick the first place to start? Yeah, leaning back on my experiences at both Coinbase, Revolut, and my co-founders' experiences at other places like PayPal, Uber, and Revolut, which is where we all met, what I had seen was that we were able to solve for SIM swap attacks. We were able to solve for third-party fraud. The one thing I wasn't able to solve for was social engineering scams. Especially, you know, if you think about it, in these social engineering scams, the attacker is convincing typically elderly victims to install TeamViewer on their computer or any desk or Citrix, any of these sort of remote screen sharing tools. And then they, they, the tactic is basically they, they'll say, hey, you know, I can get you to make a quick return on your investment. I'll help you set up an account at a crypto exchange. Then they will take you down the path of walking you through how to set up an account at the crypto exchange. And during that process, they are basically convincing you on how to do KYC, which is uploading your driver license, etc. So everything about the account will check out. You know, the KYC will be that of the, the true owner of the identity. The IP address will be that of the, the true owner, which is the victim in this case. The device identity will be valid, et cetera, et cetera. So the crypto exchange in this case has no clue that, you know, somebody else has guided a victim into setting up their account. So I just wasn't able to solve for this at all. I did a, like a very wide and deep search across the industry to find a provider who could help us. And I couldn't find anyone, which is why, which is when I met my co-founders, Zahid, one of my co-founders, you know, when we started brainstorming, we were like, he presented to me some ideas on how we could actually solve for it. And that, that became the underpinning for, you know, the first product that we built, which is device intelligence. So in our device intelligence product, what we do is, you know, we can determine the riskiness of a device and we also track users' behavior in the following way. So we know, you know, we look at typing speed, we look at, you know, are you copy pasting details? Because if you, for example, copy paste your name and address into the signup form, then, you know, it definitely means that you probably bought identity from somewhere else from the dark web and you're copy pasting it. We also, in the case of going back to the social engineering scams, we came up with a way for actually detecting that multiple people are controlling the screen, both on web or mobile, as in, you know, there are multiple people who are moving the mouse or multiple people who are typing together, etc. And we built our device intelligence SDK to capture this information and to give you this insight in real time so that now you can actually detect, you know, that an account was set up under coercion, under social engineering, and alert the crypto exchange or the fintech to stop this victim or to prevent this victim from being defrauded, right? So in other words, yeah, to answer your question, the quick summary is that, you know, yeah, you're right, like the space is huge. And we just took the approach that I, I wanted to solve for the problem that 
was still unsolved in the industry. And I knew that if we could solve it, you know, there would be a big market because a lot of crypto exchanges would need it. And actually, it turns out that not just crypto exchanges, because as I said back earlier, crypto is kind of the bellwether for new fraud patterns. So now we see this social engineering scam affecting Zelle and other faster payment, push payment methods like faster payments in the UK as well. So the market opportunity in front of us is really, really larger than we even anticipated. I was going to ask you how that's been going. And are there metrics you could share in terms of, I don't know, whether it's transactions processed or accounts processed? Like at what scale are you operating now? So Sardine is a two and a half year old company. We've been selling for a little over a year. And we've now, we now have like somewhere between 130 and 150 customers who have signed up on our platform, including some of the largest neo banks and crypto exchanges. And we have, in terms of number of devices profile, it's like in the 200s of millions. In terms of the dollar volume that has gone through our engine to detect any fraud or any illicit financial activity, that's in, that recently crossed $100 billion as well. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and we're just getting started. <laughs> you have a number of products that you've built out. So you have some things that people can integrate into their own engines. But how have you expanded that feature set? Like, what's the natural progression of the feature set that you see? So at Sardine, our mission is that we are in the business of risk free account funding, right? So whenever money is being loaded into a new bank digital wallet or a crypto exchange or into an FT platform, we offer, you know, essentially today two types of products. The first product is that we can take over the, the fraud risk as well as take care of compliance risk like KYC as well as transaction monitoring from an anti-money laundering point of view, right? So that's the first product. The second one we recently launched is that we also are now doing the actual account funding using both cards as well as ACH bank transfers in the US. And then pretty soon we'll launch other international payment methods as well. And the thesis once again over there is that when it comes to loading money into a digital wallet, the biggest thing that matters the most is essentially the fraud and compliance risk. So since we already take care of the fraud and compliance risk, we can essentially, when we move the money into the wallet, we can guarantee against the fraud risk, as in we take the liability into our books. Gotcha. That's interesting. And I think the onboarding experience, you can pitch it in different ways. You know, I've seen companies talk about, you know, automating data collection so it's as easy as possible for somebody to sign up and, you know, removing the paperwork or making things fully automated or, you know, being able to plaid into a bunch of bank statements and pre-fill your name and do balance checks. There's a sector of stuff dedicated on getting people in as quickly as possible. And it sounds like from what you're doing, you're moving into the piping, into the actual money movement, but you're not optimizing for as quickly as possible as much as you're optimizing for sort of marginally safe, like safe at the place where it's reasonable to run all the checks and make sure that the money is real because it's not going to bite you, you know, a couple of months down the line when you have huge problems for it. How do you think about these different positionings for onboarding? Do they reflect anything more meaningful than just, you know, different value propositions? Yeah, no, our value prop is the following that today you could actually sign up for a fintech app or, you know, sign up for a crypto exchange account within a couple of minutes using, you know, SSM verification, EKYC methods, as well as, you know, documentary KYC methods, because all of those methods are reasonably fast. However, once you have an, uh, once you have a new account within a couple of minutes, you know, the biggest friction is at the time of account funding, because now you, if you in the US want to connect a bank account via ACH, you can't actually get people to deposit money and start using that that the funds instantly because ACH is a very rudimentary payment method. It was not at all designed for account funding. And even though people have been using it for account funding, the reason you can't actually give access to the funds is because funds don't really settle for a couple of days. In fact, they, they never really settle because the fact you only know if it's settled is if you never receive a return back from Nacha, right? So that is what then prevents a lot of new banks from essentially now allowing you to access your money. Like, so you signed up for this new shiny fintech app 
and you can't even use it because you can't even bring money into it. So that is all value prop. Our value prop is that we will take on the fraud risk when you're loading money via ACH or cards. And if we find that the user, the fraud risk profile is low, we'll actually give them access to the fund so they can start spending on it instantly. Or in the case of crypto, we'll give you the crypto instantly as well so that now you can take the crypto out, you can take Ethereum or Solana out to maybe an NFT platform so you can buy your NFT right now or you could take it out to a DeFi platform because you want to participate in a staking pool or you know a liquidity pool, right? So that is our pitch. I think there is something also to the different stage that the industry is in where prioritizing more sustainable economics and better experiences for people and better experiences for businesses over kind of naked blitz scaling, you know, into as many accounts as possible, regardless of the quality of those accounts. I wanted to ask you about, well, one thing is just, is there any pushback from the various financial applications about handing over the payment pipes. I know some of this type of functionality financial institutions would think of, oh, this is just, you know, this is our compliance department. We do it. Is there any pushback of that type? Or, you know, is software now so composable that people expect to partner? In the US, for sure, there's been many banks who have embraced and adopted the model where they can act as a bank sponsor to the fintech apps, right? Because some of these more forward-looking banks, they have realized that the fintech revolution is here to stay and that it's better for them to partner, right? And yes, in, in, in that sense, we don't see any pushback. Of course, you know, the thing which is very topical, at least right now, is, is, is what, you know, a lot of, uh, some, some of these sponsor banks, they, you know, are the fintechs, right? It was probably not very clear who really owned the KYC responsibility, and, you know, it seems like there might be some regulatory scrutiny now into that whole bank sponsorship model as to very clearly outlining what you can or cannot do if you are a bank sponsoring a fintech app, right? So I'm pretty sure with some more of this regulatory clarity, it'll actually be net-net very good for the ecosystem, right? Yep, that makes sense. And can we, as a final question, talk about compliance expanding out of these initial offerings that you've built? Like, how do you think about the broader compliance platform and what are the plans for the business? Yeah, so for Sardine, as I said, we we offer two products today. So one is fraud and compliance in one unified API where, you know, you, you can use us for besides account funding fraud, which I alluded to earlier, you can also use that same API for also doing KYC and also for doing AML transaction monitoring, right? And in this product, we are just continuing to enhance it. We offer a case management solution where which offers low-code rule editor where, you know, once the engineering team of the fintech has integrated us, then the compliance and the fraud ops teams, they don't have to go back to the engineering teams at all. So we are a low-code rule editor for finance and compliance teams to make policy changes without having to rely on their own engineering team afterwards, right? So we just continue to enhance that those those functionalities and capabilities on case management. The second product which I mentioned is our money movement. So in fact, last Thursday, we had a very exciting launch. We were launch partners for Autograph, which is an NFT platform. Autograph did a launch of uh, Tom Brady's uh, signature experience NFTs. And we were the card processing platform for that. So we are now, you know, fully, you know, in the business of enabling direct fiat to NFT purchases. And we have also launched our ACH and cards to crypto already. So we have a couple of platforms such as, you know, one of the foremost and the earliest Bitcoin wallets, Bitski, they are integrated with us. So in that case as well, we, you know, besides account funding into crypto, we take on the fraud liability and we are actually delivering crypto into the, into the customer's hands while taking on that fraud liability. And stay tuned for, because later this month, actually in a couple of weeks, we'll be announcing some other very large partners for our ACH or cards to crypto as well. That's awesome. I have one more question I want to ask you about strategy and your observations on strategy. And that is that there is a cultural and I guess operating divide between, you know, like the fintech product set, which would be the revolutes of the world, 
the neobanks and so on. And even the neobanks that integrate through zero hash or some other approach, crypto trading, or you know, the digital brokerages that do the same. And much more Web3 native businesses. You know, and you've mentioned autograph and NFTs and processing transactions that way, and you know, starting to think from the asset or the value being denominated natively in a digital asset rather than assuming that people are coming into it wanting to swipe a card. I do think there's this fintech DeFi generational divide, not in terms of age, but in terms of who's attracted to them and, and how people want to play in these ecosystems. And I wonder if that's also true. There's the step change in regulatory technology, you know, because I think there was a big push for reg tech about five years ago. And it seems like for this new world, for the Web3 world, you need new players that are much more fit for purpose and that the fintech regulatory technology is going to be left behind because they're not plugging into kind of the emerging payment mechanisms. Is that a fair summary? Does that ring true to you? Am I am I missing anything? Like, how do you see that evolution? Yeah, I can't comment on the on 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 the fintech slash crypto regulatory landscape. However, what I would say is that for Sardine, we operate with a lens that there's the traditional payment methods and the traditional financial institutions on one side, and then there's the new and upcoming financial primitives, right? So, which is where neo banks and crypto exchanges and NFT platforms are on the other side. We want to be the gateway or the bridge between those two worlds of TradFi and new finance, right? In order to get billions of users into the new financial ecosystem, you need to have very solid fraud and compliance systems. And that is what Sardine is all about, right? So I hope that (laughs) answers your question. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. If our listeners want to learn more about you or about Sardine, where should they go? Very easy to find us uh, on the web. Our website is www.sardine.ai. On Twitter, you can follow us on the handle at Sardine. Fantastic. Thanks again so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.